I'm now excited to um, introduce our last speaker, um, Benjamin Dalton, uh, who is a researcher in contemporary French thought and culture, and he recently received his PhD in French from King's College London with a thesis entitled Plasticity in Contemporary French Thought, Literature and Film, Witnessing Transformations with Catherine Malabou. He currently teaches English language and literature at Paris Nanterre University and the New Sorbonne University in Paris as well. So welcome, um, Ben, from Paris. Um, he has published widely on plasticity in the writing of Marie Dariussec and Catherine Malabou, as well as on queerness and plasticity. And he's also led a collaborative project at King's on narrating plasticity, stories of transformations between the plastic arts and neurosciences. And I also want to say that he has co-hosted an absolutely fascinating um, seminar series on contemporary women's writing and the medical humanities earlier this year. Um, and which will end with a conference um, at the end of July um, as well. So welcome, um, Ben, and thank you for being here. Ben has already given a talk today. Um, so while he has saved some CO2, um, he has exerted himself more. Um, and I very much appreciate um, that you're talking to us um, this afternoon. And the title of your talk is Hospitals Beyond Borders, Opening Up Clinical Architectures in my list de Carangas, Reparer les Vivants, Catel Kileveres, Reparer les Vivants, and Contemporary French Philosophies of Medicine. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's really nice to join you in Vienna. I've never been to Vienna. Like, hopefully, I will come now that the world's opening up again. Um, okay, so for this, uh, the paper today, this is quite um, experimental and tentative, so I'm just going to try out a few ideas. Um, and I want to say as well, I won't be talking uh, kind of specifically about COVID-19 as such, but using COVID-19 as a springboard for thinking about borders and healthcare and architecture more um, more broadly. And I think we've we've been talking today about, you know, how can the humanities play uh, roles in these discussions. So hopefully, uh, you know, bringing together film, literature and philosophy will ask a few more of those, those questions of how humanities can participate. So, um, oh, sorry, I haven't got my uh, presentation on the screen. I'll just share it now. Um, okay, can you all see that? Yes. Great. Okay, so it should be full screen now. So, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been characterized by a medical insistence on barriers, les gestes barrières, as they've been referred to in France, borders, blockings, all designed to spread, uh, to block the spread of the virus and contain it. So we have worn masks, we have eaten in restaurants with tables surrounded by perspex screens, we have spoken to our families and friends only via Zoom, we have conducted marriages, christenings, funerals, conferences, yoga classes, pub quizzes, all virtually. We have all endured long quarantines and increased border security. So all of this we all know uh, very well already. Borders and barriers and the construction and maintenance of borders and barriers have become second nature in the social and clinical atmosphere of the COVID-19 pandemic. This clinical emphasis on borders and barriers, I want to suggest today, is in total opposition to what are or what have been major threads emerging in contemporary French philosophies of medicine. The contemporary French philosophies of medicine that I'll explore today, I will argue, are characterised by a view to eliminate borders, so completely the opposite. Eliminate borders, be these borders social constraints on the normative body, the biological borders of the body itself, or the architectural constraints of the hospital as space, physically. So in today's paper, I want to ask, what does the current clinical emphasis on borders and barriers mean for contemporary philosophies of medicine? How can we square French philosophy's embrace of clinical borderlessness with the pandemic's material need for borders and hygienic containment? And in order to explore these questions, I'm going to look at two works uh, which tell the same story. So Mélis de Kerangal's novel Réparer les vivants, Heal the Living is the English title, I think. Um, the filmic adapt adaptation of Kerangal's novel directed by Catel Kievere which is also called Réparer les vivants, Heal the Living. 
So I want to bring this tale of a body being prepared for organ donation into dialogue with the philosophy of Catherine Malibu on the concept of plasticity. Plasticity for Malibu is the body's inherent capacity for mutation, transformation and metamorphosis. So my argument today is that Réparer les vivants foregrounds a conception of the body as plastic, mutable, metamorphic and border, borderless in ways which resonate stronger uh, with Malibu's own concept of plasticity. Further, I suggest this conception of the body as plastically metamorphic and as crossing of various borders um, in both the book and the film of Réparer les vivants and in the philosophy of Catherine Malibu demands new conceptions of care. It demands, I will argue, that clinical care and clinical architecture respond directly to the plastic body's crossing of borders. Okay, so uh, we've got this conception of the body as metamorphic and border crossing uh, in both uh, the book, the film, and in Malibu's philosophy. And then what I will argue is uh, a kind of demand for, uh, for care to recognize this borderlessness and plasticity of the body. So first, however, a look at Kerangal's Réparer les vivants and its adaptation to film by Catel Pieveré. So Réparer les vivants tells the story of Simon Lambre. At the beginning of the novel, Simon goes surfing with some friends. Following the surfing trip, Simon and his friends are involved in a car accident. The friends get away with minor injuries. However, Simon, who is not wearing a seatbelt, sustains major head injuries and is sent to hospital in a coma. At the intensive care unit of the hospital, under the care of the head physician, Dr. Pierre Revol, it is discovered that Simon is brain dead and unresponsive to resuscitation. Following this discovery, Dr. Revol notes that Simon would be the perfect candidate for organ donation. The rest of the text details Revol's communication of this to Simon's parents, who are at first deeply against the idea of donating Simon's organs, but then finally agree. And then the text details the physical removal and transportation of Simon's organs, his heart, his lungs, his liver and his kidneys, and their re-implantation in donor bodies immediately afterwards. Simon's heart, lungs and liver go to a six-year-old, a nine-year-old and a 17-year-old respectfully. Um, respectively, sorry. Um, Simon's heart is donated to Claire Méjean, a 51-year-old woman whose health is quickly worsening with the condition myocarditis. The narrative itself then necessarily performs the borderlessness of the body, its capacity to extend past its contours, to break up into fragments and to join together with and complete and heal other bodies in the very literal sense of organ transplantation. The narrative also underlines the necessity of healthcare to communicate, work alongside and enable and extend this borderlessness rather than put in borders. The text details, for example, the logistical necessity of eliminating borders. Simon's organs need to be removed from his body, transported and re-implanted into other bodies in the shortest time possible to prevent uh, tissue de uh, decay. So in the film, this borderlessness or mutability of borders themselves is translated into a cinema cinematographic language which favours fades and tracking shots and camera movements which give the impression of a certain permeability between spaces, time periods and bodies in the clinical setting. A borderless world is portrayed from the very beginning of the film with the sequence of Simon's surfing trip. The film begins with Simon and his friends waking up very early in the morning to travel to the beach to surf. We see Simon cycling through the streets at night. These initial shots present us with a visual language of borders and delineations, road markings, street signs, flashing speed limits. Um, these reminders seek to guide and limit Simon's movement and trajectory. In stark contrast to this, when the boys are finally in the sea and beginning their surfing session, the delineations of the roads leading to the beach melt away into undulating waves. The camera is, um, I think I've got, a, so I wasn't able to take screenshots, but these are the kind of, uh, a few shots from um, Google, uh, uh, Google images of the film. So the camera is positioned at the point where the water meets the sky. So rather than a clear line dividing sea and sky, we are presented with an endlessly moving, surging, modulating divide. The camera often disappears under the water as if the sea is undermining and overcoming any attempt by the camera to maintain a clear delineation or border. 
The use of slow motion allows us to concentrate on the forms of the water itself. The waves do not organize themselves into clearly delineated forms, but rather divide into diffuse particles and foam. In one particular shot, we see bodies of the surfers plunge through a wave, now underwater. The dividing line between water and air flashes across the screen, and we see the bodies pass effortlessly from air to water, now seemingly weightless. So I want to suggest the, the overcoming and undermining of borders is performed again and again in this, in this sequence. It is portrayed as effortless, serene, weightless. Further, borders themselves, such as that between water and sky, are portrayed as mutable and malleable themselves, constantly in flux and constantly fading from view. So after this scene, the car accident occurs as the boys are traveling back from the beach. Simon's friend is driving, whilst uh, Simon is asleep in the back of the van with another friend. We see as the driver's eyes lull as he becomes more and more tired. A shot uh, displays the driver's view looking out onto the windscreen. The open road ahead. The horizon splits the screen perfectly 50-50, a clearly delineated border uh, with road and fields on the bottom and sky on the top. As the driver falls asleep, however, the road begins to disappear and morph into the sea. The clear delineation between ground and sky once again dissolves into a moving, undelineable plane of waves until finally the camera is swallowed up by one of these waves, suggesting that the car has crashed. So my argument now is that moving to the clinical setting of the hospital after this part of the film, the film does not revert back to a language of lines and delineations, even if lines and borders might be more readily associated with the instruments of measurement and mapping associated with medical science and hospital care. Rather, the film goes further into exploring visual and spatial languages of borderlessness within the clinical setting. So it kind of translates the borderlessness of the surfing and the sea and the liquidity of the water into the clinical setting rather than reimposing clinical borders. It is not the white walls and divides of hospital space that dominate in the film, but rather the dissolves and modes of transport between these spaces. Tracking shots or dolly shots are often used within the hospital, demonstrating a fluid movement between rooms and spaces. Further, the lobby of the hospital itself comprises large walls of glass opening onto greenery behind, rendering blurred any clear distinction between inside and outside. Um, and I was actually thinking of that during the first presentation about um, ecology and, and viruses and, and thinking about how the hospital in the film is presented with this quite green backdrop of um, quite ecological, natural backdrop. Um, the final scenes detailing the, the transport of organs, swap uh, of the organs being taken to the patients, show uh, helicopters, planes, cars and motorbikes to be ambulant liminal clinical spaces in their own rights. So not only are these clinical spaces mutable, they're also mobile and ambulant and also permeable. So this borderlessness, movability, traversability, extendability of the body is intimately connected in the novel to a conception of the body as mutable and metamorphic and to all living matter and to the universe itself as mutable and metamorphic more broadly. The Dr. Revol, uh, in particular, expresses his philosophy of an endlessly metamorphic body and universe in descriptions of his inner thoughts and dreams. At the beginning of the novel, as he surveys the brain scans of Simon Lambre, which show his brain to be irrevocably damaged following his injuries from the car accident, he recalls a moment when, in, when he was uh, on holiday in the Alps and tried Piotl for the first time. I don't know whether I pronounced that right. So Piotl is a small cactus used for inducing hallucinations, and I thought that I would have a random picture of this cactus. So uh, Revol thinks back to the night he experimented with the cactus. So um, this bit's in French, but I'm going to do a little uh, uh, translation of it. So Revol songe à cette nuit étincelante où la voûte céleste s'était déchirée au-dessus des montagnes, libérant des espèces insoupçonnées où ils avaient cherché à s'engouffrer, couché dans l'herbe, le dos contre la terre, et soudain il est traversé par l'idée d'un univers en expansion, en devenir perpétuel, un espace où la mort cellulaire serait opératrice des métamorphoses, où la mort travaillerait le vivant comme le silence travaille le le bruit, le noir, la lumière ou le statique, le mobile. Une intuition fugitive qui persiste sur sa rétine, rétine alors même que ses yeux reviennent 
zoné sur l'écran de l'ordinateur, sur ce rectangle de 16 pouces irradié de lumière noire où s'annonce la cessation de toute activité mentale dans le cerveau de Simon Lambre. So that, um, I think the, the, uh, the uh, yellow bit that I've highlighted is the most interesting. So he, he like gets this idea of a universe and expansion in constant unbroken becoming a space where cell death would be the operator of metamorphoses, where death would work life like silence works, um, noise like uh, darkness works the um, light, etc, etc. So it's this kind of destructive creative view of the universe as constantly metamorphosizing. So these thoughts foreground Dr. Revol's philosophy of innate, all-encompassing plasticity and malleability of all bodies and matter, an univers en expansion en devenir perp perpetuel, as I've just uh, cited. Particularly striking in Revol's vision is the notion of the destructive creative activity of the matter of the universe. In particular, he refers to cell death, la mort cellulaire, also known as apoptosis, as a process which enables bodily formations and transformations. We read in the novel that Revol has a copy of the French biologist uh, Jean-Claude Amaison's La Sculpture du Vivant, uh, The Sculpture of Life, on his bookshelf. The reference to Amaison and the evoked model of creative destructive plasticity of the universe in Revol's inner thoughts strongly evoke, uh, I would argue, the philosophical work of Catherine Malibu on plasticity as a creative destructive formative annihilating force innate to all living things and all matter. In fact, it makes me wonder if Kerangal had read Malibu as, as she was writing Réparer les, les vivants. So um, I'll now turn to Malibu. So the themes of the expansion, malleability, plasticity, and creative destructibility of the body that are clearly present in Réparer les vivants strongly resonate with the philosophical work of Catherine Malibu on the concept of bodily plasticity. So firstly, um, a, so this is Catherine Malibu. Uh, firstly, a whistle-stop tour of Malibu's philosophy and its relation to medicine and pathology. So Malibu is a contemporary philosopher whose interdisciplinary work explores dialogues between continental philosophy, biology, in particular neurobiology, and the medical sciences, among other disciplines. Malibu's central concept is that of plasticity, or la plasticité in French, which she elaborates at the intersections of these disciplines. Plasticity for Malibu describes an innate transformability at the heart of all life forms and structures of life. The word plasticity comes from the Greek plasine, which means to shape or to mold. Throughout her work, for example, Malibu returns to the example of the plastic arts. Sculpture, in particular, entails the sculpting or man manipulation of form. So that's a really clear um, example of, of plasticity and plastic arts. She also evokes plastic surgery, the nipping and tucking through which the body becomes molded like a sculpture. She evokes plastics, the synthetic materials can be anything from our bank cards to Barbie, to 3D printed medical implants. However, plasticity does not just mean change or mutability. Malibu specifies, plastic describes something that can both take form and give form. Plasticity is the power to transform, but also to resist endless manipulation and hold a form in place, no matter how fleetingly. Um, so I'll read I, I, this in French on the screen, but I'll read them in English. So the adjective, um, I quote, the adjective plastic, while certainly in opposition to rigid, fixed, ossified, is not to be confused with polymorphous. Things that are plastic preserve their shape, as does the marble in a statue. Once given a configuration, it is unable to recover its initial form. However, Malibu shows uh, how there is also an explosive dynamitic side of plasticity. Here she is talking about plastic explosives and the threat of uh, plasticage. So uh, plasticity is two opposites. Uh, on the one hand, she says, these, shape, these concrete shapes to which a form is crystallized, such as sculpture, but also simultaneously, uh, plasticity can refer to the annihilation of all form, such as uh, the bomb, or uh, in French, you say plasticage, which means bombing, or la bombe, pla the plas uh, I think in German, you could say plastic bomber or as, as, as well. Um, so that association with explosiveness. Um, 
So following her initial work on plasticity in philosophical contexts, Malibu goes on to focus on the sciences and in particular contemporary biology and epigenetics. The innate transformability that plasticity describes to be found is most uh, radically found, Malibu shows repeatedly, in the biological mutability of all organic life. This mutability is increasingly emerging in scientific research into biological and neurobiological plasticity. So the plastic brain. The human brain, for instance, is neuroplastic in that it changes and manipulates its own form throughout a lifetime. Neural identity shapes itself, self sculpts, develops and becomes through changing its own plastic synaptic form. Malibu is, however, not primarily interested in the plasticity of the healthy brain. Again, Malibu insists upon the explosive element of plasticity and neuroplasticity. At the heart of Malibu's philosophy is, in fact, a consideration of what happens when plasticity goes wrong. Plasticity, Malibu tells us, describes not just malleability, but also fragility and explosivity. Plasticity can only too easily become plasticage. Uh, so uh, in, in relation to the brain, this is showed uh, most clearly in neuropathology and brain traumas. Following a neural event, the brain can become irrevocably damaged and a person's former identity can be forever transformed or lost entirely. So Malibu's threefold definition of plasticity, the giving, the receiving, and the exploding of form, finds its neurological correlate in the brain's teetering on the line between malleability and vulnerability, uh, resilience, and total destruction. This neuroplastic vulnerability and explosivity is for Malibu a good thing, uh, a very positive thing, and a source of immense creativity and freedom. This is because plasticity, even in its most destructive moments, has the potentiality for both creation and resistance. She contrasts plasticity with flexibility, um, which is a characteristic praised in uh, neoliberal descriptions of work commonly, arguing that flexibility is merely the capacity to stretch and return to a prior state and does not possess the creative destructive genius of plasticity. So Malibu uh, explains, uh, Today, I quote, uh, today the true sense of plasticity is hidden and we tend to constantly substitute it for its mistaken cognate, flexibility. The difference between these two terms appears insignificant. Nevertheless, flexibility is the ideological avatar of plasticity. Further, to be flexible is to receive a form or impression, to be able to fold oneself, to take the fold, not to give it, to be docile, to not explode. Indeed, what flexibility lacks is a resource of giving form, the power to create, to invent, or even to erase an impression, the power to style. Flexibility is plasticity minus its genius. So how might Malibu's philosophy open up new ways of thinking about clinical space and care? Malibu's philosophy also touches on more personal ground, recalling her own grandmother's transformation through Alzheimer's and detailing the sudden indifference, indifference and emotional detachment of her grandma. Um, here we find a direct engagement with the space of the hospital and a bold but fleeting suggestion of how hospitals and clinical environments could be different. Malibu evokes in particular how going to the hospital was a violent experience for her grandmother. Um, and she proposes another way of imagining therapy for people with Alzheimer's relating to questions of space and belonging. So I quote, um, so she's talking about what she'd have done differently uh, in her grandmother's care had she known. Uh, so she says, I would have understood, despite the incoherent behaviour and visible indifference of my grandmother, the degree to which hospitalisation was violent for her. I would have tried to take her back for a few uh, uh, home for a few hours. I would have given her the chance to regain her familiar surroundings, her things. I would not have tried to get her to regain her memory at any cost, but rather I would have left her, as Proust says, to be present at or to witness her own absence. So the problem with recurrent, uh, sorry, current therapies, Malibu suggests, is that they try to force people with brain injuries or neuro neurodegenerative diseases to remember their past selves in ways which do not help them and in fact leads to further distress. Indeed, initiatives such as memory rooms have been used to treat people with Alzheimer's. These rooms aim to recreate spaces from a person's youth, for, for example, from the 1940s or 50s, filled with furniture, textures, wallpaper, products, smells that might allow a person to recover parts of their memory. However, Malibu goes in completely the opposite direction. Malibu wants to take her grandmother home and put her in familiar surroundings, not to try and restore or recover her grandma's memory, but rather to allow her grandma to experience her own absence or, and to experience 
and explore her sense of self strangeness as prompted by these surroundings. So I read this as Malibu's temp attempt to transform and even reverse the relationship between space and therapy in clinical care. Out of Malibu's philosophy emerges a proposition whereby the hospital attempts not to reverse, resist or restore loss of memory or loss of self, but rather to let be, accept and even lean into this loss, self strangeness and self absence. Um, so, uh, and, and so this is kind of like where I, I, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'll try and I'll bring it to a, a quick uh, conclusion here. So this is where I kind of want to uh, bring it back to consideration of the film, kind of Malibu's, um, I, I, I'm trying to argue that Malibu's philosophy can help us think about uh, opening up clinical space as, uh, as an experience of strangeness and transformation rather than a space that would uh, restore you to a normative state and that this resonates with the film Reparer les Vivants as a film that kind of tries to preach a kind of clinical lack of fear towards borderlessness and mutability and, and the crossing of borders within a clinical context. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to skip a little bit. And uh, I did an interview with uh, Malibu and I asked her how we can put her ideas into physical clinical spaces, how, um, how this could be kind of uh, reflected in actual clinical architecture. And um, she, uh, I'll just read a tiny bit of this quote. She said, we should imagine hospitals and other clinical institutions like real spaces of living, artists should design these spaces. Alzheimer's patients, for example, lose their capacities for orientation. So let's build them gardens with sculptures through which they can walk like labyrinths. And further, um, uh, she goes on to, to name an actual project uh, by two architects. She says, there is a project for Alzheimer's gardens by Arakara and Jins called Healing Funhouse. Arakara and Jins designed a kind of labyrinth in which you cannot get lost because there's a sort of thread, something that guides you, even for very disorient, uh, disorientated people. And at the same time, you experience these colors and shapes. So um, I'll just, I'll end on that. And, and th this is who she's talking about. Uh, Shusaku Arakara and Madeline Jins, who did a lot of very experimental architectures, both for living and also for clinical spaces. Uh, a lot of their architectures kind of were organized around questions of healing and how the body um, experiences itself within space. And one thing that really resonates with Malibu's thought is that they designed architectures to kind of sustain the body in a sense of strangeness. They wanted the body always to kind of be feeling itself change and aware of its self strangeness and aware of its own transformations, rather than building architectures to make us feel stable and uh, normative. And so I think it's a really interesting idea to think what these architectural, I mean, here are a few kind of pictures of their experimental architectures, what these kind of very unpractical architectures that look very impractical, how they could actually be employed within clinical settings and to what purposes um, and kind of how that would, how that speaks to uh, to something like um, Reparer les Vivants in its own uh, analysis of borderlessness. So just to conclude, um, I'll say, uh, both Reparer les Vivants as text and film and the philosophy of Catherine Malibu place the metamorphic body at the centre of an exploration of how clinical spaces and clinical care must creatively adapt to the challenges and potentials of the body's constant metamorphosis, plasticity and borderlessness. Um, so it remains to be seen how, how the philosophical insights of both Catherine Malibu and the works of medical fiction like Réparer les Vivants might be translated into actual clinical architectures and practices. And kind of th those are the questions that I want to op and open up, I guess, with my own research. And yeah, so this is kind of like a, a start, a very tentative start in that exploration. So thanks very much. <laughs>